What's up, sports fans? My name is Lucas Weiss, host of the Weiss Sports Chronicles podcast. Our next guest is Jeff Perlman. He is a New York Times bestselling author, and he has a new book out, Three Ring Circus, a book that details the Kobe Bryant and Shaquille O'Neal era with the Los Angeles Lakers. In this episode, I chat with Jeff about the highs and lows of writing a book, interviewing the various cast of characters on the Lakers, as well as his evaluation of the current sports media landscape and a really interesting story of Jeff going to the Northwest Territories in Canada, something that you don't want to miss. The We Sports Chronicles podcast is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. So make sure to like, rate, watch, and subscribe to all three of those channels. Now let's get to today's episode with Jeff Perlman on the Wii Sports Chronicles podcast. All right, my next guest on the Wii Sports Chronicles podcast needs no introduction. He is a New York Times bestselling author of several books. He has a new book out, Three Ring Circus, Kobe, Shaq, Phil, and the Crazy Years of the Lakers Dynasty. He is Jeff Perlman. Jeff, thanks so much for coming on the podcast, man. You just said that I needed no introduction, but then gave me an introduction. (laughs) I'm more confused. I, 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 you know, I mean, you know, it's, you know, I, I had to say some things. I mean, I could go on and on and talk about where you went to school and write for Sports Illustrated, but I just wanted to give uh, the, the listeners a little bit uh, so, so that they would, they would keep listening. Do you know where I went to school? Yes. University of Delaware. Can you name the nickname? Oh. You're, you're putting me on this. You're, 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 you're putting me on the spot. Jeez. I, oh. I do not. I'm sorry. You know the Blue Hens. The Blue, blue hens. hens. I do know the capital city. It's Dover. So, Correct. so. Interestingly, uh, like many states, nothing to do there. <laughs> yeah. No. 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 Very. Very true. Very true. Well. Well. Listen, Jeff. I mean, I'm really excited to have you on. We'll. We'll get into the to the book in just a bit. But I've read on your Twitter that you've done over a hundred like interviews, podcasts for the store for, for this book. And I'm just curious, like have the law of diminishing returns set in, like how do you keep uh, every interview podcast authentic and new and exciting? I think it really depends on you more than me. If you think about it, <laughs> like it depends what the person is asking and if they ask original questions and um, yeah, probably diminished returns are kicking in a little bit, but um, I just kind of view it as, if someone is nice enough to ask me to appear on their show, I don't care if they have three listeners or 10 million listeners. I mean, I wrote a book. I put it out there. If they're nice enough to ask me to appear, why would I say no? Who am I to say no? So, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, am I going to get as many uh, book sales off of this as I would being a Colin Coward or Jim Rome? Probably not, but I'm honored to be here and flattered to be here. So, What's the worst question you've been asked thus far? It's not... Um, the worst, the one I get asked over and over again, I, and it's a fair question. I say, so why, why the Showtime, why the Shaq Kobe Lakers? It's a fair question. You're asking me about the book, but my answer is boring, and it's you know it's one of those questions you're like, oh, I've been asked 200 times this question. It just I don't have anything original to say. So what? I'll ask it in a different way, but not exactly the same way. What? What made the publisher or the editor decide to publish this story when there's so many books out there already about Kobe, Shaq, Lakers, etc.? Yeah, see, that was original. That was pretty good. I give you a seven out of ten on that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that um, if you're a publisher, so we'll just put it in the mind of a publisher. Publisher in, are in this to uh, uh, publish books and make money, right? Mm-hmm. Quality books and make money. Well, first of all, you have a franchise that's one of the biggies. You basically have the Lakers, the Cowboys, the Yankees, Manchester United, or your big four franchises in sports, I would say. And then a bunch of others that are close. But number two, you have major characters, Shaq, Kobe, Phil. Um, I'm not saying this like arrogantly because I'm not Stephen King or Michael Lewis, but you have an author who's had some success. So it's mm-hmm. not like I'm a first time author pitching the book. You know, you know, you know, the track record isn't terrible. So. I think those are kind of the things, you know, I knew when I came up with the idea that the odds were pretty good, I would at least get a book deal. I didn't know what it would be, but I knew that there was just a lot of good ingredients for that story. So 
did you have to go to the publisher with like a list of who you were going to talk about or did you have to get that like or did you have to then go to the book publisher with like quotes and recordings and interviews that you've already done no so i um one thing that has changed a little bit for me my first almost every book deal i would write a proposal that was like 35 40 pages long very detailed you know sample chapter probably with my first book i don't know a lot of stuff and as i've gotten older and i've had kind of some success they require less so maybe it'll be a five page or four page kind of briefing on the, here's what i want to do and i'm going to interview all these people and blah 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 and that's it also you can't i mean i can't really guarantee who's going to talk to me for a book if i haven't done the reporting yet so it'd be weird for me to just be like i'm going to get so you no know, you just uh at this point in my career, at least I'm able to say, I'm going to report the hell of it. I'm going to work really hard. I'm going to bust my ass, and hopefully I'll give you a good book. And I'm kind of lucky that people still give me a shot. I find proposals just, like, they have to happen, but they're ultimately, I find it just unnecessary. Like, I mean, you have to do it just for the formality. But if you look back at probably the original proposal, it must be a vastly different to what the finished product is, is it? Usually. It's not even the same thing. I always say, in a lot of ways, book proposals are nonsense. Um, because how can you know what you're going to find after you report it, after you interview 400 to 500 people and dig through tons of clips? So maybe it's more of a reassurance to publishers that you have a grasp of the topic to a certain degree. But I don't think I've ever written a proposal that ended up like the book. You know, it'd be bad if it did. Whatever. Every now and then someone will say, so did this differ a lot? from the proposal and I say different almost entirely from the proposal because I didn't know what I was doing I was just taking a guess you know so uh yeah I would say um you have to have them especially with younger writers obviously because you don't know what you're going to get and you need some at least inkling that they know what they're doing but um they're not they're not if you, if if you're an author and your book reads like your proposal you did something wrong What's amazing about this Lakers era, and, and I was very young when this team won three straight championships. And I, I'm I'm 24 currently, so I was about five or six when they won in 2000, 2001. So that offends me. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm uh, I'm a young lead. I still sort of, I guess, but it's. I feel like like the Lakers were the first introduction for many basketball fans of what a dynasty meant. I mean, obviously you had the Yankees and and whatnot, but for me it was it was the Lakers. It was this Lakers. It was the the purple and gold, the flash, the gl- the glitz and the glam, Shaq, Kobe. But reading the book, this team was just so dysfunctional, and <laughs> like it was so close to blowing up so many different times. Do you think that that gets more eyeballs reading this book knowing that just like the drama of all these characters is just makes for really great storytelling i would say nobody nobody's paying to read a book about these seven and nine cleveland browns of like 2004 you know like people do like characters and drama and highs and lows and sort of fighting through and i mean Shaq and kobe make it really interesting in and of themselves because they just have this weird relationship of highs and a lot of lows and kind of tolerating each other more than embracing each other. And then you throw in this coach who's super successful, but has never really coached someone as exasperating as Kobe. And that's really interesting. And, um, you know, it's a lot of really interesting players who come and go through that dynasty, which fascinates me. I love the bit players. I love the side players. I love Dennis Rodman showing up and playing for the team or J.R. Ryder, just kind of quirky guys. And I don't know. It's just, I think what what helps a book like this a couple of things. I don't mean to keep moving here. Is um number one, they have big characters. They were wildly successful. So you have these warm memories of being a kid and here are the Lakers. A lot of people have those warm memories. That's really the power of nostalgia. Mm-hmm. A lot of my books are driven by the power of nostalgia because I have the power of nostalgia. Like I am drawn to nostalgia in sports. Sports are one of those things. Sports, music, and food. Mm-hmm. The three things I can think of where they place you, you you watch a clip of Kobe and you remember being nine years old sitting with your dad watching game four of some series or you hear a song by Bruce Springsteen and you remember being 12 and going to a concert and you know what I mean like and food you smell something being cooked and it reminds you of grandma back mm-hmm. 30 years ago whatever 
sports is one of those things that does that. And I do think this topic, a lot of people, like I remember growing up, I grew up watching the Magic Johnson the Freedom Lakers. I remember being a kid in New York, the playoffs would be on, it'd be Celtics Lakers. They would do this zoom in shot of the Lakers <laughs> playing at the forum. You'd see the palm trees, you'd see the Laker girls. They'd usually take a break and show a shot of the ocean like Manhattan Beach. I'd be like, that looks like the most magical and majestic place on earth. And part of that was because I was probably eight years old and it looked that way to me. But I still have those feelings in me because of the power of nostalgia in sports. So maybe you have those too. And that makes this book appealing, even if you were kind of little when it happened. There's something appealing about always having those memories and then being able to read a book and, ha and have those memories relived. It's powerful stuff. It's like a drug. No, 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 it really is. Like, like for me, like I, I remember sitting in my living room with my mom and dad and my brother watching that Game 7 Lakers Blazers and just being like, it was one of the first, in 2000, it was one of like the first comebacks that I remember. And it's like, like daddy, mommy, like who, who, who is this guy? Kobe Bryant. And like, it just, it, it was so just incredibly powerful. And like in the book, it's amazing how like that moment I found was sort of like the turning point of this franchise because there were so many moments in 2000 where the franchise could have been broken up. There were trade talks. It could have never worked, but like it was that game in that deficit in that moment that just turned the tide and made the Lakers dynasty of the early 2000s what it was. I don't disagree with that, but I do think what you say, what we were just discussing is really interesting. Like um, people always talk about, stuff like, oh, should the Lakers have won more titles, right? Mm. Should they have won more titles? Or, or why wasn't Dale Harris the right coach and Phil Jackson? Where would they go down in history? And will Kobe go down better and LeBron, all that stuff? And I really think the thing that these guys do, and maybe it doesn't get discussed enough, is they they just give us these really warm feelings at mm. last. You know, like, that's pretty freaking powerful. But <laughs> we never talk about that. We always talk about, should they and could they have and we'd like debating and is this team better than that team and blah blah we never think man what a freaking beautiful memory i have thanks to kobe bryant or thanks to Shaq or stefan marbury or alan iverson any of these guys like they gave me this sense of place when i was a kid where i was able to watch it and just have these wide eyes and just be amazed at kobe Bryant. i mean it's really for me like watching the lakers as a kid and the celtics battle i have some really strong ties to sports because of that i just think too often we're always focused on the end result of a game itself and not thinking about the beautiful journey that's taking us on. So you've kind of reminded me of that today. And I appreciate that. Well, speaking of journeys, writing is a journey. It can have its highs and it can have its lows like uh, like the Lakers more dynasty. More lows, as, as uh, you mentioned in the book. Sometimes. What were those lows? I mean, like when, when you talk about the lows, were there like moments where you didn't, like where you may have doubted whether this book could be published? Or was it just like just trying to figure out, okay, how to construct this big topic and sift through the interviews and picking out the moments that will really stick with the reader? It's more, um, every book I write thinks, I think sucks at some point. Mm. And I always think this is the end of my career and this is a disaster. And this is the one, this is the one that sucks. My wife just is just tired of it. And it's like, I think people sometimes, I say this with no disrespect. When they're your age, they look at someone my age and they'll think like, that guy's got it figured out or that woman's got it figured out or they're really on top of things. And what you don't realize at 24 is you have the same exact feelings you have at 48. Your back just hurts. Like, <laughs> it's the same feelings. It's the same doubt and worry. And like, instead of rising, you're worried about falling. So you're concerned, if this book doesn't do well, am I even going to be able to write another book? And there's some, some guy who's half my age coming along who wants to write these books and he's, I'm like, it's a lot of writing comes with a lot of insecurity, like a lot of insecurity. Um, it just does. So it's not, there's never a point in a book where I honestly sincerely think I'm never going to finish this. this is, I'm never going to be able to finish it. Never. I might have slivers of moments like that when I'm really down for a couple of minutes. It's more like, this is going to be terrible. Nobody's going to want to read this. Nobody's going to say it sucks. Blah, 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 blah. Then I start having anxiety and the mm -hmm. whole, like writing, I'm telling you, it is not, for someone like myself, who's actually an extrovert, it is not a natural pro uh, profession. I should be working in a supermarket, greeting people. I'd be much happier probably doing it, but somehow I found myself here, and the highs I get from it are so immensely high that it's worth it, but there are a lot of lows. It is a freaking isolating and lonely and in-your-head profession. Does that draw you 
to keep writing those immense highs, like feeling those highs again, sort of like a drug, as you say? It's kind of like, um, I heard Kobe Bryant actually say something once, and I'm usually not one who quotes athletes and uses their <laughs> stuff this way, but he was like, being at the gym at two in the morning, taking jumpers, it's like, in a way, that is the dream. I'm like, I think to a certain degree, what he meant is you don't get the highs without the lows. Mm. Like, you just don't. That's why people use drugs, because they want the artificial high without the drugs. I mean, without the, the lows that come with it, you know? But, like, without that struggle and without the nightmare, you don't get the joy of seeing your book arrive in the mail. You don't get your joy of talking about it or your joy. Like, part of the joy is, like, you have this wealth of information at your disposal. So now... I worked on this for two years. I'm kind of an expert on the 96 to 04 Lakers. That's sort of cool in a weird way. And like, I went to the bookstore today to see my book for the first time in the bookstore. I hadn't done it yet. It's a thrill, man. It's a freaking thrill. <laughs> I, I always go up to the cashier, pretend I don't know, and say, do you have um, the book Three Ring Circus in? And they'll be like, do you know who the author is? And I go, I don't know, it's someone Perlman or something. And they'll be like, oh, yeah, it's in the it's in the new upfront. <laughs> that sounds super corny. It is super corny. I do that every book, and it's like this thrill where it's like, you matter. You wrote this book. And in this little bookstore, in this little sliver, you matter. And in this world where so much is going wrong, it's like a little oasis of joy. And that's what keeps me going despite the rough parts of it. And also what keeps me going is I'm 48 years old. I, Because of writing, I've been able to be home for my kids growing up. I never wear shoes. I get to work out of coffee shops. <laughs> um, there are a lot of highs to it. It's just the lows are really low and difficult. This book is amazing in many different ways, but just in terms of the quantity of voices that you, you, you put into this book and, and just the research. And what I was really impressed with is just the voices of journalists who, who, who offered their insight on, on, on to the era. Was that a choice by, by, by you, like a deliberate choice to just you know talk to as many journalists as possible to get their input and insight onto this era into the book? Another good question. But I haven't been asked. I've hmm. done 11 interviews. I have not been asked that. That's great. Um, I wrote my first book. My first book was about the 1986 New York Mets. It was called The Bad Guys One. Hmm. I didn't interview any writers. I think probably because I was afraid they would think I was an imposter and shouldn't be writing the book. Like, they were all New York writers who covered the team. I'm some 30-year-old guy from Sports Illustrated or 29 at the time, whatever I was. What the hell do you know? Like, what are you? who's this guy? That was just some fraud. So I didn't talk to any writers. And I think I realized after that, like writers are just the people who are on the ground. Number one, a couple of things. Number one, they were there. They covered it. So they have insights I would lack and they can tell me about important games that I wouldn't know in important moments. Number two, which is oddly really important, they'll tell you things a lot of times that they were told off the record in 1986 and they were never able to use, but they're like, you should look for this. And mm. that's huge. That's helped me so much. And it's not my judgment call to make whether someone should do that or not, but it works, it works well for you. And generally also what I've learned, especially as I've gotten older is, um, for the most part, I think there's a real kinship with the writers. Mm. Like I just described the hell of it all. Well, the guy covered the Mets with the New York times and the daily news and so-and-so and my wife who wrote a book and all these people, they all know the hell of writing and the tough parts of writing and the difficulties of writing. So usually when you go up to them and say, I'm working on a book I found, um, they're actually happy to help you. And also a little flattered that you asked. So I changed my philosophy. I did complete 180 on that philosophy. And now I definitely talk to Ryder. I mean, a perfect example is the Lakers had a guy named J.R. Ryder. Mm. He was kind of out there. And he one day he said to a writer, he was mad at a writer, and he said, I know where your family lives. And I think that's a really important moment in J.R. Ryder. And the only reason I got that is because some writer told me because it happened in Tim Brown and the LA Times. So now I always talk to writers. And if they don't want to talk to me, they don't have to. But almost, they almost always do. And I would talk to them. People, writers ever have questions for me, I, I always talk to. Like, we're in the same, we're all in the same boat here. What was the most surprising thing that a writer told you and did it make it into the book? Now, if it didn't make it in the book, it's probably because I couldn't tell you. Okay. <laughs> Something um, that you can tell me. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, um, I don't have a great answer. I mean, I really did enjoy hearing uh, two different writers tell me, two different writers. Tell me that J.R. Ryder said to them, number one, he was mad at one writer in Minnesota, and he said, I know where you live. And then when he was mad at Tim Brown of the LA Times, he said, I know where your family lives. 
and that was both from writers and that was fantastic so those are things that are good but also like one of the things writers provide that I thought really oh Jay Dante gave me something great he used to cover for the LA Times he was talking about how there were Shaq guys and Kobe guys in the locker room and as a member of the media you actually had to pick I'm going to be a Shaq guy I'm going to be a Kobe guy and he was saying how awkward it was and how clumsy it was you really had to make this weird decision that as a journalist you wouldn't normally make you wouldn't normally say I'm a Shaq guy or Kobe guy you'd say I covered the Lakers these two guys kind of forced you into that position. I learned that from writers. Because then I had like Howard Beck, uh, now mm. Bleach Report, elaborate on that, Tim Brown of the LA Times, and different writers. And that became a really fascinating point of the book. So that was good. That was really important. For, and that was all from writers. That's really interesting, that that, that point about, you know, Co- you're, you're on Team Kobe, you're on Team Shaq, and that uh, applied to the media as well. After yeah. finishing and writing this book and interviewing various different players, coaches, have your perceptions of any of the main characters changed after writing this book? Yeah. I mean, I spent a long time with Phil Jackson in Montana. Mm. And I didn't really, you know, he always seemed kind of mysterious in a weird way, which sounds dumb because he was really mysterious, but I didn't really know much about him. I just found him really thoughtful and interesting. And he's one of the rare guys you interview in sports who actually asks you questions about yourself, which is more rare than you think. <laughs> And he just was really, inter- really interesting human being. I thought Shaq, my family, I come from a huge Shaq. My wife and my kids were like huge Shaq fans. Mm. So I went in kind of curious if I would find that guy or if I'd be disappointed. I certainly did not have a preconceived notion. I certainly didn't care how he, like, it's a book. It has nothing to do with how my family feels about Shaq. I thought he was even better. Like mm-hmm. the Shaq I found in the stories I got from teammates was just insane and amazing. And I would say with Kobe, my big takeaway for me personally was I kind of felt bad for him. I kind mm. of felt sympathy. I think he was alone on those teams. I think he didn't really know how to engage with other teammates. I think it's kind of sad that he spent a lot of his 20s like a man on an island, uh, not really enjoying it and lathering it in all the success the way other guys did. And I think considering how life short is and he shows that with his recent passing, it's a shame when you have these big moments and you think you're always going to save them for later. Like, I'll enjoy it when I retire. I'll be able to look back when I retire. And then you die at 41. It's a, it's a horrible, horrible thing. It's interesting with with, with Kobe because we, 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 we've we recently watched The Last Dance. We're a few months removed from that documentary. We see Michael Jordan and how motivated he was and how he motivated himself and, and his teammates. But and there's a lot of comparisons, obviously, between MJ and Kobe. But I think like Kobe was actually a little bit more harder to deal with. from And, and from reading the book, like just because... As you say, he was on that island very much aloof and alone and and doing his own thing. Whereas while Michael was very much like he he was a was a self-motivator, I think he took a lot more criticism and, and learned more and was willing to learn more later on in his career than than Kobe was, certainly in those early years with the Lakers. I'll say one thing I just thought of right now. I swear to God, it's just into my head right now. <laughs> I guess he has another good question there, actually, is um, Michael Jordan never had to contend with someone on his NBA team be- being better than him. Never. Mm. So, by the time he came into the NBA with the Bulls, um, there was no competition. There was no one ever better than him. Kobe shows up, and he has Shaq. And Shaq is better than him for year, year, you know, year after year after year after year. He's this dominant player, and Kobe has to be number two. And I will say, it is kind of interesting, like, Jordan had Pittman, but Jordan was superior to Pittman. Jordan had Tony Kukoc, he was superior to Kukoc. Even when he was on the Washington Wizards at the end of his career, he was 39, 40 years old, he was still the alpha on that team, even though they had, um, I think, Jerry Stackhouse and Richard Hamilton. He was always the guy. Kobe never, or Jordan never had to deal with that, having a Shaq. And it would be interesting to see if maybe that changes, our perception of Jordan changes, if he had to be the number two guy. And he always felt like he was fighting to be the number one guy. I think Kobe came along in this era where he had to watch a lot of guys he was drafted with become, have stature he wanted. You know, Iverson in particular. Iverson shows up in Philly and he's the man immediately. If he wants to score 40, he's scoring 40 and he, the ball is in his hands. I think for a guy like Kobe, that kind of stuff was really difficult. So he was harder to coach than Jordan, but he also had different circumstances in Jordan that maybe made him a little, made it a little tricky. No, that's no, that, that's a very good point. I mean, because of course, Shaq. I mean, you you had these two two alpha males, and 
in the end, the two alpha males couldn't stay together. And for me, it's just amazing, like, how they even lasted that long. And, like, I think, like, there, again, like I said, me I mentioned earlier, there were so many moments in the book where it could have broken up. And, and while I think there's a longing for that dynasty to perhaps have continued from players, I think you got to be just grateful that that they were able to make it work to, pr to produce three consecutive championships, which, like you said, it's all about those beautiful moments. I agree with you. I also think if you look back, it's so freaking stupid that there's even an argument about Alpha. Mm. Like, who gives a crap? Like, yeah. If you really think about it, why does that even matter? It's the dumbest freaking thing. It really is kind of just infuriatingly dumb how, okay, we have two guys on the Lakers. They're both wonderfully talented. They're both making millions upon millions of dollars to play a game and throw a ball in a round. You know, it's like they, they have millions of people cheering for them. They're beloved. They're famous. They have endorsement, like everything you could possibly want. And you're concerned who the quote unquote alpha is, which isn't even really a thing. Like it's so stupid. Like, are, are you two dogs? Like, is this two dogs fighting over a piece of meat? And just sometimes when I think about it, it actually makes me angry because with a little more maturity, they could have handled it so much better. I don't even mean winning and losing. I just mean as humans. It's kind of embarrassing. And sometimes we get sucked into it. We'll be like, ah, two alphas. And, you know, it's like, no. Like, there are a lot of competitive people who work well together and who feed off one each other. They don't hate each other because the other guy has more status. But these two guys sometimes are just so immature about it. It's actually kind of exasperating. You actually you had a question pop into my head just now. Do you think that athletes who may act aloof or sort of like Colby now in terms of that aloofness and being on an island. Like, do you think that they're more understood now than maybe back then just because there's more, I don't know, awareness about mental illness, what's going on with someone's personal life, etc. Like, because it seemed like from some of the columns that were written about this team, like it just felt like they were like, they were very critical and just, and rightfully so, given certain circumstances that occurred. But I don't know. I just feel like perhaps maybe we may understand athletes now that may act a little different more than 20 years ago. I'm just curious your thoughts. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I think one area where definitely times have changed and perceptions have changed are in regards to mental health. Like, um, I wrote a book years ago about the 1990s Dallas Cowboys, and they had a guy named Charles Haley who was a defensive planner. Mm. And uh, you didn't read that book, did you? It's okay. You didn't. I've heard of it. Boys will be boys, <laughs> right? Boy, bo boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. You are not judged for not reading that Okay. Book. Okay. Um, this is over. This <laughs> you get, yeah, we're done. We're done. Um, <laughs> we're done. <laughs> yeah. no, I'm kidding. How dare you not read an obscure 19, you know, book from 15 years ago. About the <laughs> um, but Charles Haley was a guy who, you know, he used to do crazy stuff. He would masturbate in front of teammates, and he was really vicious and erratic and once ripped open someone's car and peed in the car through the converter, like really, really bad, right? And I wrote the book and I look back at how I wrote as a younger writer and I kind of made fun of him. You know, I kind of made fun of him. And like, he was later diagnosed as bipolar. And there's a character in this book where I've already talked about, J.R. Ryder, who was all over the map and probably has some mental illness too. And I do feel like as years have passed, um, we have become more comfortable talking about mental illness and it's a little less comfortable just calling someone crazy. And I think I use the word crazy in this book to describe either J.R. Ryder or Dennis Robin. And when I read it after the book came out, I was a little cringy. Mm. I think crazy is not a fair word for someone who's going through struggles. In his behavior might be, maybe even crazy is the right word to describe the behavior, but the person, I don't think so. So I do think that's an area. But uh, in terms of Kobe, I mean, he was just really, he was just aloof, you know, and he was just... I, I don't know. Maybe not, actually. In a way, no, because we used to do more deep dives back in the day. Like, back in the day when I was at Sports Illustrated, Kobe comes along. They're going to be like, all right, write 5,000 words on Kobe Bryant hmm. and talk to everyone and figure out who this guy is. Now, it's someone tweeting, oh, Kobe Bryant, why is he so serious? Click. Yeah. You know? Not a lot of context. Like it's like, yeah. So, so I disagree with that. I think we had better analysis back in the day, actually. Interesting. Gerald Ryder, you have a very you, you you leave an interesting interaction with him, and 
I'm sure you've been asked to, 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 to share that interaction and, and I'll do it here as well because I think it just shows to especially my younger listeners like the importance of just never giving up and just and just grinding and hustling to get a story and and to not you know to do whatever it takes ultimately to to speak to someone to try and and add more more voice and perspective for the book well i'm um i'm a fan of knocking on doors and uh it's not easy knocking on doors is never easy when it comes to tracking down a source and it's uncomfortable and it's a little scary and you sit there and you worry. And what happened to me actually years and years ago, I did a story where I had to track down a guy who murdered someone. This is in Gary, Indiana, maybe 15 years ago. And, um, I flew out to Gary, Indiana, went to this guy's house. My daughter was only about two at the time, one or two, I think. And, uh, I sat outside his house. It's a murderer's house. I'm waiting and I'm waiting. And it's a really bad area and no one's around. And I kept thinking, like, what will happen to me if this guy kills me? Hmm. Was that a gun or something? I don't know. He murdered someone. Waited and waited and waited. And I backed out. I didn't do it. I've been, I've regretted that for 15 years. Hmm. I should have done it. It sounds the opposite. Like, oh, you made a wise decision. You should have done it. Should have done it. And I hate that. So, since then, even though every time I walk out through the door, it is scary. It's not like you ever get over that. It's like when you're on, I always say, it's like when you're on a flight and it's really, really turbulent. Yep. And you know you'll probably be okay, but it's scary. Yep. You know, yep. And you look at the flight attendants and their seatbelts are on. And you're like, oh. So, <laughs> J.R. Ryder was a player for the, uh, for the Lakers just for one year, 2000, 2001. As I mentioned earlier, he threatened to threaten a couple of reporters. He definitely was unstable. And all I had was an address. I know a phone number. I was going to be in Arizona. I live in California. So I drove to his house one morning and I knocked on the door and I was nervous. I was definitely nervous. You know, you do this. <sighs> okay. <laughs> I probably say that to myself. Okay. I knock on the door. I have a book with me. My last book I wrote about the US and I was in my hands. And uh, kid answers. He's like, and I'm like, hey, I'm looking for JR. Right. Closes the door. <laughs> a woman comes. Can I help you? My name's Jeff Perlman. I'm a writer, and I'm looking for J.R. Ryder. For she closes the door. I hear two people yelling. A woman and a man. <laughs> J.R. Ryder comes to the door. Who are you? Well, my name's Jeff Perlman. I'm a writer. I'm working a book about that. No, 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 no. bro. Yeah, bro. No, you do not. He sounded meaner than I sounded. Bro, you do <laughs> not walk up to someone's door, bro. And he comes out. It's like, bro, not cool, man. Not cool at all, bro, bro. What's that book you have? Well, I wrote a book about the USFL. Is that Trump, Trump League? I'm like, yeah. What are you writing a book on now? Well, it's like the Lakers, Shaq, Kobe era. Good years. All right, man, I'll talk to you. I'll talk to you. <laughs> gave me two hours. It was on the phone. He gave me his number and said, you couldn't talk now, call me. I called him and gave me two hours of an awesome interview. So uh, I thought that J.R. Ryder was going to kick my ass, and instead he ended up being one of the best and a really nice guy and a really smart guy. Why was he one of the best Like for your book? He was—he would talk about everything. You know, he was just wide open and funny and charismatic and had good stories that he remembered. And he was just, you know, the best thing you can have in an interview subject are people who are unenc unencumbered. Mm. They don't owe anyone anything. They're not in contact. You're always better off interviewing people who are not in touch with the people that they played with. Because they're, more, they're not worried about the repercussions of someone calling them two days later. That's very important. And J.R. Ryder is kind of an island. You know, he doesn't, he's not involved in the NBA anymore. He's not going to Lake or Unions. So he was only there for one year and he barely played. So guys like that are, are usually important. He was great and really nice too. Like a really nice guy. I couldn't have couldn't have asked for a better interview with the guy. I bet some of my l younger listeners like cringe at the thought of interviewing someone for two hours. And like for me, I do a podcast and it's, you know, anywhere between 30 minutes and an hour. And and for, for a younger journalists, interview interviewing is so important for a job in this career but how do you like how do you interview someone for two hours like it, it sounds simple but it's just like how do you ensure that from the start to the finish that it's captivating you can get the good answers out of your interview subject well it doesn't have to be two hours <laughs> i spent eight hours with phil jackson i spent half hour with kareem rush they both had great value kareem mm. rush, Laker, they both had great value the um, 
it sounds simple, and I'm sure everyone here has heard other journalists say, but it's true. The best interviews are conversations, not interviews. So, like, I'm talking to J.R. Ryder, just because I'm kind of a loser. I know a lot about J.R. Ryder's career, right? But I also know where he's from, where he went to high school, where he went to college, his whole journey. It's important to know that stuff when you go into an interview. And then you can be like, oh, man, when's the last time you were back in Oakland? Oh, I don't go to Oakland anymore, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Oh, man, I was just there a few weeks ago. Oh, why were you there? Blah, 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 blah. Like, it softens everything. It gets allows you to get to know him, so it's not insincere. Um, I just think the more casual things are, like, I don't actually understand why someone wouldn't want a two-hour interview, because I think the best part of this job is that you have an invisible badge that says, ask any questions you want. I mean, where else in what other walk of life can you ask someone you've never met before about his mother dying of cancer? Mm. Or ask, what's the best Christmas gift you ever got? Or ask, remember that time, blah, 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 you were caught sm- smoking coke in a, snorting coke in a corner. Like, what happened there? Like, you are allowed, you have a badge that allows you to answer these, ask these questions. And I mean, there are better writers than me, there are better reporters than me, there's better everything than me. And I'm not saying that with humility, factually, they're better. Um, one thing I've, I, I've always been good at, and my parents have always said this to me, is I'm genuinely curious about people, and I genuinely want to know their stories. Even if it doesn't make it in a book, I always, I'm always a guy asking people, what's the grossest thing you've ever smelled? Or what's the weirdest thing you've ever seen? Or if I'm in a deli, you know, or like now, I'm always asking people, COVID, how's, how, how are customers treating you? How many assholes do you have without a mask? You know, mm-hmm. stuff like that. I'm just curious. Like, I like hearing people's stories more than I like telling my own. So for me, a two-hour interview with J.R. Ryder, I don't have to talk about myself, and I get to hear all these cool things about a guy who played in the NBA for two years. That's amazing. I I hate Donald Trump. With every, <laughs> every pass in my body, I hate Donald Trump. If you give me a two-hour interview with Donald Trump, yeah, I would take it. Mm. I want to hear all about his life. You know, like, yeah. if you give me, I'm a Jewish guy from New York. If you told me do a profile on this skinhead KKK member, and I knew he wasn't going to stab me, I would take it in a second. Mm. I just want to know about people's lives. I love so one thing that keeps me going is hearing about people's lives. So to me, a two-hour interview, an eight-hour interview, I'll take them all. I love interviews. I had Mark Craig on the show. He's a senior MLB writer for The Athletic. And he mm-hmm. said that journalism is, you know, you're a professional learner. And I think you, mis- you know, encapsulated that perfectly, how you have to be curious. You have to be seeking answers and asking questions. But I just find so often when I speak with, you know, my colleagues as young journalists that so many are just bogged down by like, you know, they write the questions down. They just like ask those questions and then they don't allow time for follow-ups. And I just think like, look, the better conversations, the better podcasts, the better, the better podcasts, they're conversations. And I just think that when you, you know, obviously you need more reps and you need more opportunities to talk to people. But at the end of the day, if you, if you as you say, if you make it natural and make it sound like a conversation, it'll genuinely lead to better answers from your interview subjects. Well, you did something before during this podcast that I thought, I swear to God, as soon as you did it, I was like, nine out of 10 aren't doing that. I said something and you asked a question off of what I said. Like, I'm sure you have different things you kind of want to get to, but you, you heard me say something and you paused wherever you were and you responded. And that's, I mean, interviewing one-on-one is the worst thing you can do is go in with your list of questions. I mean, I've seen it happen where if you, some guy will be, you know, it'll be after a baseball game, like when I used to cover baseball and some Yankee hit a game winning home run and he dedicated it to his mother. Well, why do you dedicate to your mother? And she raised me for the time, you know, I, she died of cancer two weeks ago and I've just been crushed and this one's for her. And the next person says, so, on that third inning single, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, wait, did you not just hear this guy saying his mother just died of cancer? You kind of need to stick here, you know? And so, I do think you see with experienced journalists, with, like, you're paying attention. And I, uh, I would agree. Um, you have to be super curious. You have to be super open-minded. You have to be. I've never met a good journalist. I've never met a good journalist who's a racist, bigot, homophobe, mm-hmm. any of that. You just... You can't be because yeah. you have to want to know about people's lives and you have to be curious and open-minded about it. And um, you also like, you have to be um, just willing. You have to be willing to not talk about yourself. You just, there's a natural human thing to do that we all have. I think honestly put in us, most of us do. You're telling a story. 
And maybe you're telling a story about the time you went to Yankee Stadium. And in my head, somewhere along the line, I think to myself, oh, yeah, I went to Yankee Stadium. I had a great time there. I bought the hot dog beer special for $2. I caught a, f- a foul ball from Derek Jeter. I can't wait to interrupt this conversation so I can tell my story about it. And journalists, what they need to do is shut off that inclination. It's not about you. And you have to let people finish their stories. And they don't care that you are at Yankee Stadium, too. And you shouldn't care because it's not about you. And that's something you just work on. And just from repetition, like anything, riding a bike, you develop it. And I've known many good writers who won't shut up. And that is a big problem for them when it comes to journalism. Because they're great writers, but they won't shut the fuck up. And you need to be quiet to do this. So I didn't mean to curse. No, it's all good, man. It, we're, 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 uh, we're, we're explicit here, so it's all good. But you spend a couple chapters talking about Kobe's sexual assault case in Eagle, Colorado. And one of the chapters was primarily just transcript of what happened or allegedly what happened that night. Was that the only method of, of approaching that part of Kobe's story? And did you ever think about changing or changing how you approached it given Kobe's death? Well, it was done. By the time Kobe died, the book was done. Okay. The only thing I could do was add a pro a author's note at the beginning. So I had no choice in that regard. Um, but I wouldn't have changed it. And that might make me sound like an ass. And I actually can understand why people say that. But like, end of the day, I'm not, I'm trying to write, I'm, I'm not saying I'm writing the biography of Malcolm X or, you know, Richard Nixon or something, or, you know, Justin Trudeau or whatever. Like, it's not, I did that Canadian for you. Yeah, thank um, you. Thank you. Appreciate yeah, it. No charge. Um, I'm not saying this is as serious, but like, it's history. Like, I'm writing about sports history and these teams are historic in the context of sports. I'm not saying it's important, but they are. So it wouldn't make sense that you would write a book about this era. Kobe Bryant dies. It's horrible. It's tragic. It's awful. And then you say, I'm going to expunge part of that history. I'm going to leave mm-hmm. part of that history. It just wouldn't make sense. I think the better argument is when should you publish the book? Like when's the right time? Um, do you wait longer? Do you, what do you do? And I never had a great answer. I didn't really know. I still don't know the answer to that. I never thought of taking it out it never even crossed my mind now as far as writing it with the transcript I just when I first read the transcript of the interviews he did first the rape victim uh, alleged rape victim did with the detectives and then that he did with the detectives I just thought it was freaking so ridiculously gripping yeah and so it's just back and forth Mm-hmm. But it's ten, like didn't yeah. it's like oh, absolutely! It was like on yeah, the edge of my seat. Feel. Yeah, it was just it was so tense, and you could feel. My wife and I were talking. We've talked about this multiple times now. You read it, and you're just screaming at Kobe Bryant. Say you need your attorney. Yeah, don't talk anymore. It's whether you like whatever you think of Kobe Bryant. It's unbelievable that he's sitting there going into this stuff. And like, never thinks to himself, I need, and also there's a part where the detectives are like, you tell, just tell your bodyguards you're good and we're going to take you back to your room. Yeah. Like if you've even had one of his bodyguards come, I think one of them was a freaking undercover or an off duty police officer. Yeah. That guy would have been like, Kobe, don't, what are you doing? Stop. You can't talk to them. So I just thought the way it was written because it was gripping to me when I just read it researching, I didn't think I could paraphrase it any better or write as a narrative any better than it was. So I just put it out there that way. Hopefully it worked. No, I think it did. And like I, I think your point about expunging history, I mean, like, look, journalists are supposed to tell the truth. And like I think, you know, look, when when Kobe died, of course it was it was tragic and he and he touched a lot of people, but in the days that fall when people were writing those obituaries, some focused strictly on the basketball, but some did talk about this and I think those that did include this section I think were, were were honest because it was definitely a part of his legacy whether we like it or not and as much as I still as that little kid you know remember Kobe Bryant and, and, and the great things that he did it's still connected to his legacy and it's part of the history of this era that, that needs to be told also the other thing is it's interesting is I was just thinking this, like, 
let's say I found out, let's say I was researching the book and I found out he was a faithful husband throughout his marriage. And then one night on the road in Charlotte, he fooled around with a bartender. Okay. He made out with a bartender, blah, 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 blah. Definitely not. I mean, you could make the argument. It could go in and speak to a certain something, but like certainly not necessary. You know, like you could make the same argument not to put it in this. You can't, first of all, it's, it was usually covered. It was usually public record. Um, it was all over the place. It'd be much weirder and more egregious to not include it. And it would have to be like years ago, there was a, a Bill Cosby biography by a yep. guy named Mark Whitaker it came out six years ago and they include nothing about any of his sexual proclivities <laughs> and crimes. Um, and that ruined that guy's reputation as a writer, you know, but like your job, if you enter this, you have to decide, do you want to do this job? Do you not want to do this job? If you want to do this job, you have to write the truth. And that doesn't mean you have to include everything. If it's something that monumental, um, I don't see a choice you have. I just don't. Do you think people's perception of Kobe after reading this book have will, will change? Not really. They might think he was a little more of a pain in the ass as a younger player. But I think ultimately, again, living out, I've been out here for six years in California. I'm from New York. And when he died, I was blown away by the level of sadness. Not surprised, but blown away. And I think really what the sadness was about more than anything, like great players come and go all the time. Mm-hmm. The sport leagues go on and people retire, new people come. It's always there. There's always a new Jeter. Derek Jeter retired. There was a new, you know, new shortstop comes along and eventually people kind of move on. Well, Kobe Bryant represented the people out here at least was like dogged, dogged, dogged determination mm. and never quitting and trying your best and trying your best and trying your best. And also, I think it represented at least to a certain degree, uh, the powers of redemption and mm. remaking yourself and him as a dad of four, uh, him as a youth girls basketball coach. So will it change some perceptions? Maybe a little like, uh, he was kind of a dick when he was younger, you know, like that kind of stuff. But I think that's okay. Like, I don't think that's a, if you were, if Kobe Brown was your hero before you read this book, Kobe Brown would be your hero after this. And I always say, if you're, if you love Kobe Bryant and you don't want to hear anything bad about him, well, just don't read the book. Like, you don't have to read the book. Mm-hmm. It's totally cool. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with idolizing a guy just as a basketball player, loving him as a basketball player, and not wanting to know anything else about him. There's nothing at all wrong with that. I have no problem with that. You don't want to read the book. If you think it will make you unhappy or tarnish something that you feel for Kobe, you shouldn't read it. This is, you know, that's just don't. It's not a big deal. Yeah, no, I think like I think that's an interesting point. And like I think for me, like I think having what he was in this era and then seeing who he became, like an Academy Award winner, a girl dad, a lot of the, you know, really shows a real coming of age. And like if I think it, I, I think that's it makes it for a really compelling narrative. And I think for, for human beings and whatnot, we need to understand that look, people are complex. Kobe was complex. He wasn't perfect, and and he was certainly aloof, as we've talked about. But people can change, and people can grow, and and evolve, and become different, better human beings. And 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 I think we we certainly saw that with Kobe. And it's just unfortunate that his life was cut short. Because I think the act that he was currently on was probably could be one of the best acts of his life, like what he was doing off the court with basketball and whatnot. One thing that always makes me bristle, though, I will say. So I have a daughter who's, uh, she's 17. Mm-hmm. I have two kids, you know, they're everything to that. It's me. I would mm. give my life for either one of them. I've been having my nails painted by my daughter for years. That's great. I've been playing when my daughter was little, I was playing dolls with her. She's 17 now, but I'd be playing dolls with her. That's awesome. I'd be getting makeup with her. I'd be everything you could imagine. I would do with my daughter, right? everything we used to go. We go to the mall every week and we go to Sephora, the makeup store, and try on everything. And blah, blah, That's blah. awesome. But I'm not even saying that. I'm saying, like, it's weird how, like, girl dad became this hashtag. Like, and I always think, like, why wouldn't you be a girl dad? Like, yeah. what, what is that even? Is someone not a, are you saying that you're surprised that a guy who has four daughters could be, I'd be thrilled if I had four daughters. Like, this whole, like, old notion that, like, wow, isn't it special that he's paying attention to his daughters? Like, what kind of asshole doesn't? You know, like what kind of jerk doesn't like you're supposed to, I never, this is not about Kobe. It's just about or this weird hashtag, the girl's dad, girl dad hashtag. Yeah. Like 
I've been a girl dad for 17 years and freaking love it. Like, I don't even know. And I'm, and millions just like me. It's kind of weird that like, we're, we're surprised. We're pleasantly surprised that someone loved his daughters and treat his daughters as he would his sons, you know? I don't know. No, 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 I think so. Weird? No, I know. I, I definitely think it's weird, but I, I think that, do you think that though Kobe's, like what happened like in Eagle, Colorado may, and like, and how he changed certainly made him sure. associate with the girl, girl that a lot more compared to let's say Jeff Perlman. Well, first of all, he's a trillion, bazillion times. I'm getting my patent on the charger. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's he's all a good. Gazillion, trillion guys more famous than I am. So no one would ever think of Jeff Perlman as a girl dad. I'm just saying, like, I get what you're saying. And I guess part of it was, but it's kind of weird if you think of it that way. We used to think he almost went to jail for allegedly raping a woman. But look, now he's a girl dad. So that's yeah. like, like it's, I'm just saying, like, I'm just saying overall, us dads. I'm assuming you don't have kids yet. No, no. We dads should not be getting credit because we treat our girls with the same love we mm -hmm. treat boys or the same everything we treat boys. You're supposed to. You should love your girls and be just as happy to have a girl as you have a boy. And I just think that whole girl dad thing, there's a little bit of, again, it's not about Kobe. It's just in general. Yeah. Like, it's like, wow, I can't. He's so good. He's so great with his daughter. Like, again, was he not supposed to be? Yeah. You, I just think it's weird. I really, I've always thought it's weird. I've always, I remember when I was a very young dad and we were at a Costco. You have Costco in Canada? We do, yes. Nice. Great and place. Costco, <laughs> and my daughter was maybe six months old and uh, she pooped her diaper and I had to change her. <laughs> and this woman comes up, I always remember this woman comes up to me and she goes, um, do you want me to do that for you? Like change the diaper. Oh my gosh. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. Just the other day. Then just the other day, actually, one of my son's teachers wrote him and said, I need a note from your mother. And I was literally writing the note as it said, like people still have low expectations for fathers. And I just think when we're surprised that dads are good with girls, it adds to that. I don't like that. I've never liked that. But I think Kobe was, it seemed like a great dad. So that's not disrespecting Kobe at all. Mm -hmm. And he certainly didn't do the hashtag girl dad. He just <laughs> was a girl dad. No, of course. No, no, that's, that's very true. I just lost all your listeners. No, no, no. Like, I was here for the Lakers. <laughs> no, we're 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 gonna get we're we're gonna we're gonna move uh, we're gonna move back because no, but it's really interesting. Okay. I, I again, it's all about the conversation, Jeff, which which is awesome. Um, you wrote over three hundred pages in this book about the Lakers and probably did even more research. I'm just curious, like, was there research that just couldn't be in the book that you may have wanted to be in the book, but just because of constraints, yeah. couldn't be? I end up printing out usually 10,000 pages of notes and I do 300 and something interviews and probably 8% of that gets used. You know, like it's a, and you leave things on the floor. I forgot what it was just the other day. I was rereading a transcript for some reason. And I was like, oh, that was actually really good. I forgot that. Sometimes you lit, you just flat out forget stuff. Actually, someone in an interview the other day said to me, this is almost, this is not a good own, but it's true. Someone said to me, so what did you write about? He hadn't read the book. He's, what did you write about, about the conflict between Kobe's wife and Carl Malone? Mm. And I thought to myself, shit, I didn't write a damn thing about it. I just kind of didn't write about it. I forgot about it. It was sort of interesting, actually. I could have devoted a couple of paragraphs to that in there somewhere. Totally, completely forgot. So, yeah, I leave stuff out. I'm not perfect. I definitely... Does that get to you as a writer? Does that get to you as a writer? Like that you just leave stuff yeah. out that there that there are holes? Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah. I mean, the things that kill me, like, there are things that kill me. There are things that kill me about every single book I write. With this book already, I had a woman write me. She went to high school with Kobe Bryant. I mentioned her name from a story I got. I think it appeared in the Philadelphia Inquirer about 20 years ago. About, I think, I'm not sure, about Kobe Bryant winning her a prize at a fair. And she wrote me and she said, my friends told me I was in your book. It's so thrilling. One thing, I don't have an R in my last name. Now, I'm pretty sure her last name was misspelled that way in the article I got it from. But that shit burns me up. Mm. You know, like, so, I actually, a lot of authors say I never read what they write. I will comb through the book to find the things I did wrong in some weird, self-mutilating sense of hell. You know, like, I just do. I'll sit there on the toilet or brushing my teeth and I'll just open it up randomly and be like, ah, 
or that, or ugh, that, that could have been better. So, yeah. I have a couple finishing questions for you. And okay. one of them is just sort of about sports media and sports journalism landscape in general. Because as we talked a little bit off the air, you know, you took a very traditional journalism path. You went to the University of Delaware, Tennessee, and you ended up at Sports Illustrated, now New York Times bestselling author. If you were starting the career now, do you think you would have survived as long as you have currently? Oh, man. You know what? I would say yes because one thing I've always had um, going for me that I don't think this is a brag because I think most people I worked with will tell you this is just freaking dogged like yeah. dogged like I wanted it so badly um, I would say when I was at Sports Illustrated I would show up in my off days I was a scrub and I would just call one college after another saying my name is Jeff Perlman I'm a young reporter at Sports Illustrated do you have any story ideas hi my name is Jeff Perlman I'm here over and over and over and I would show up with ideas um, there's no replacement for being hungry and like hungry I'm not talking about, like, I say this to my students. Sometimes I teach on occasion as an adjunct college professor. And I'll say, like, there's a difference between wanting it. Like, I really want to be in journalism. Well, would you move to uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma? No, because I kind of want to be near my boyfriend. Or I want to be mm-hmm. near my girlfriend. Or would you move to Bethesda, Maryland? I don't know. I don't really like the cold. Like, and wanting it. And wanting it is, I'll go wherever the freak you want me to go. I will take any job out of college. I just want to write. I just want to write. Like, I was always that guy. I, I, I mean, I took summer internships. I took a summer internship. I was lucky my parents were the best. I took a summer internship after my sophomore year of college in Champaign, Urbana, Illinois, making like four bucks an hour, five bucks an hour. I didn't know anyone writing for a small newspaper um, because I desperately wanted it. So I just think, you know, priority of skills change and needs change and certainly the medium has changed it's very frustrating but i do think the one thing that can take you far is just a really really strong desire and a you know just you'll bust your ass harder than everyone always better writers always better reporters you can be the hardest worker and i always felt like i was going to be the hardest worker yeah you can't understate those intangibles i mean i've had I'm sure several of, of several of your former colleagues at SI on the show, Alan Shipnuck, Alexander Wolf, others who, and like, they share that. Like, they're willing to go around the world to like very wow. obscure places. We were, I'm telling you right now, I was at Sports Illustrated with those guys. It was a freaking lion's den, Sports Illustrated. It was yeah. the, all, the one thing we all had in common was we all fucking wanted it really bad. Hmm. And we, we, we were all people at one point or another who dreamed of being writers for Sports Illustrated and freaking chased it and chased it and chased it and hungered for it. And like when you got to the magazine, you felt this pressure, unspoken or otherwise, that your story had to be better than everyone else. And that motivated you to just report the hell out of it. And it wasn't always better. Obviously, there were great writers everywhere, better writers than you. But like those, uh, you will not talk to an SI writer from that era who had a good run there who wasn't just hungry. And that stuff. I mean, like, I'm good friends with Mirren Fader, yep. Bleach Report. Mirren's freaking hungry. Mirren came to me five or six years ago when she was writing for a newspaper, the Orange County Register, and she heard I moved to Orange County, and she came and talked to me. She comes with a notepad and a pen, taking notes. Mm. Like, what the hell is this? I'm like, she has busted her ass. You know, she has busted her ass. I'm like... There will always be better writers. There will always be better reporters. But she freaking is known for busting her ass. So you want to, if you want a generational example of someone who got to where they're getting by working harder than everyone else, there she is. She's right there. When people pick up Three Rain Circus, what's the biggest takeaway you want people to get from reading your book? I always say, I've been asked that a bunch, and it's <laughs> actually a good question. And I always say the same thing. I'm not making fun of you. That was a good question. Okay. Um, I think 2020 is the worst year ever. Yeah. Right? You would agree, right? Oh, 100%. It sucks. Yeah. 2020, this year for me, we all have our stuff, but like, starts with Kobe dying, which is devastating. Yep. And more devastating. I feel like I felt it more than I normally would because I had this book coming out, but 
not because of how it affected the book, just this guy I've been thinking about. You have the Australian fires, you have COVID, you have the California fires. Yeah. You have a whole slew of people, Chadwick Boseman, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Yeah. John Thompson, like all these crazy deaths. Um, Trump is driving me insane and I just freaking want him to go far away. Yeah. Like my dog died. Mm. My father-in-law's wife died. Like it's just been that year. Yeah. Right? Horrible. 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 And I lived through 9-11 in New York and I, I always thought this is going to be the worst. It is worse this year in many ways. This past week promoting the book, right? For me, has been a real vacation from that. Like it's actually been a real vacation from that. It's been a nice I haven't thought that much about politics or COVID. I've just had a nice time. And I really hope, and I mean this, like people read the book and they get a nice vacation from all the shit we're going through. And it gives them a little sense of nostalgia and maybe a laugh or two or a cry or two or remembering how great Shaq was or how great Kobe was or Glenn Rice, any of that stuff. If it gives you a little break from the dreariness of what we're all going through, I don't care. You don't have to think of the book one minute after you're done. I don't care if you get it from the library or steal it from a friend. I'd, I'd like... <laughs> If you can get some joy out of it, I swear, I almost feel like crying. Like that would be plenty for me. So that's what I hope. I don't care if there's any lessons out of it. I don't care if you never think of the book again. Like if you can get some joy out of it, great. I've done, I've done a good job. I ask this final question to all my American guests. Do you have any stories of your time and your career in Canada that, that stand out to you? Oh, man. Let me think for a minute. I have a couple, actually. Okay. Oh, I'll give you a great one. Okay. I have a great one for you. Okay. This is my favorite, one of my favorite career stories ever. I'm so happy you asked that. After I left Sports Illustrated, I went for one year to Newsday. I was tired of sports and I wanted to do something besides sports. So I got a job at Newsday, which is a newspaper. Yeah. You know Newsday? I, I do, yes. It's a newspaper. It used to be a real powerhouse newspaper. It's hit the, gone the way of the crapper, but it used to be a big. big yeah, country. for sure. I got a job as a feature writer, non sports feature writer. I just wrote long stories for like the magazine section. One year we were having a freezing cold winter <laughs> in New York. It was really bad. My editor calls me and her name was Barbara Schuler. And she calls me one day and she said, we have an idea. We want you to do it. We want to find the coldest spot in North America right now. And we want to fly you there. <laughs> we want you to write about being in the coldest spot in North America. And that is how I came to taking, I think it was three planes or two to Yellowknife, Canada. Oh, yes. In Northwest Territories. Yes. I get there. <laughs> it's negative 40 when I get off the plane, okay? Mm. I, I moved to California to escape like 10 degrees, you know, like yeah. negative 40. I remember getting off the plane and walking into the cold and just your, it was my chin felt like it was just going to fall off. Like I thought my chin was just going to drop off my face. Oh, yeah. I was there for three days. Have you been to Yellowknife? I have not, but in Toronto, like we complain at like minus ten, minus fifteen. So I can't. So I can't even yeah. imagine what minus forty is like. You know, it's an old mining town of some sort, and there's nothing there, and it's really industrial and pretty grim. But the one thing they said, you're going to be here three nights, and I stayed in a bed and breakfast, like which was basically someone's living room, and there's freezing in there, <laughs> and they said. um, if you're here for three nights, you're going to see uh, Aurora Borealis. Yes. Northern Lights. Northern Lights. You're guaranteed to see it. You're guaranteed to see it. And it's worth it. It's so amazing. Three nights, nothing. Wow. <laughs> and then I wrote the story. I filed it from my little bed and breakfast, freezing bed and breakfast. And the lead was all about a guy. He was called the Snow King. And he used to build every um, every winter in Yellowknife, you'd build these on a lake these frozen views like igloos and he got these his snot would freeze on his beard and he got these things called snotsicles wow and the lead to my story was him saying snotsicles and my editor took out the word snotsicles because he thought it was offensive and i thought that was one of the dumbest edits of all time yeah and that was my trip to canada i've been many times but that was one wow what what a great way to end this podcast, Jeff Perlman, he is the author of Three Rain Circus. He's also a New York Times bestselling author of many books, but Three Rain Circus is out right now. Make sure to, to get your hands on a copy because it's a real treat to read. Jeff, thank you so much for joining me today on the We Sports Chronicles podcast. Thank you so much. It was fun.